Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Welcome. So glad you're here. Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. The church was growing fast, and guess what happens when you grow? You have growing pains. Anyone remember those? Man, my legs hurt, my hips hurt, ankles hurt, everything hurt. Growing pains. The church was doing really well, but with growth comes those growing pains, those challenges, things to adjust, the adjustments that needs to take place. And in our story today, the the, the apostles had their hands full with a big need and the solution was the Holy Spirit, amen? The solution God had and they just needed to figure it out. And so we're gonna learn about that. I just wanna get right in, all right? So Acts chapter six, what I'm gonna do is uh, teach um, some, or I'm gonna read the scripture, I'm gonna teach some, read the scripture, teach. I do wanna let you know that I really enjoy the, the New Living Translation. I really like that, that version of the Bible. But in this particular scripture, it, it does not help explain it enough. So I'm gonna teach a little bit more of that. Um, and, and this particular rendering of the Greek into the English, I'm not a huge fan of this portion of scripture in the New Living Translation. NIV seems to get it right. Uh, New King James Version seems to get it right. This one gets a little too uh, broad and doesn't get specific with some words. And I'm gonna explain that here in a moment, but let's get right into it. Verse one, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, some versions say disciples, so new, new Christians, new believers, there were rumblings of discontent. There was complaints. How many of you know about complaints in church? I know I do as a pastor. The Greek speaking believers complained about the Hebrew speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. Now, the reason why I struggle with this translation is because it makes it sound like two different groups of people when the reality is they were all Jews here that turned towards Christianity. They were all Jewish Christian believers, so Jewish descent, all right? But those who lived outside of Jerusalem tended to speak in the Greek language because of Alexander's, Alexander Great's influence on the entire region, Greek, Greek language spread throughout the region. And so people were able to understand each other better. All right, but the people who lived in Jerusalem that were Jewish uh, believers and became Christians, they spoke Aramaic. They had the Hebraic language primarily. And so if you're not careful with your translations or, or if you don't dig deeper, you might think that it's uh, the Greeks and the Jews. It's not, it's actually all Jews that just became believers. And those who primarily speak Greek, um, they felt neglected, they felt overlooked of, uh, for their widows being cared for. And so it's a, it's a problem. And if you don't address moles, sometimes they become mountains, right? Mole hills become mountains, right? And in the Bible, caring for widows is actually a big deal. Look at Psalm 68, five on the screen. For father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God whose dwelling is holy. Not on the screen yet, but it will. Hey, hey. I want you to see that though. Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God. God cares about widows. And you could say the same, he cares about widowers. Psalm 146, nine, the Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. Of course, you should read that in context. And then James 1, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Interesting there, James basically says, loving others and loving God, stay holy. Be obedient to the Lord. There could be other reasons why there's these complaints and they feel discriminated against or overlooked. It could be that the devil is stirring up division. 
It could be that the devil is trying to get people who struggle with a language barrier to come at each other and cause division. Why? Because the church is growing and multiplying rapidly. So I could see the devil sneaking in. I could also see the human flesh element of it. That those who do get help, they're taking it and they're not helping the Greek speaking widows a little bit. You know, maybe, maybe this could be the situation. The Jewish, uh, the Hebraic speaking uh, believer receives the gift from the table and, you know, the food needed or the money, whatever's needed. And they see the Greek speaking person not receive anything. I could see them splitting it and helping, but maybe that's not happening. Maybe they're taking it and going. What about the, the selfless sacrifice to help those in need? Could that be an element? It very well could be. Here's the deal though. We don't really know except for one thing. All we get here is, is that the church was multiplying so much that people were simply being overlooked. Simple as that. And uh, we don't have anything else. We don't have rebukes from, uh, from the apostles saying, hey, you're, you're, you're um, showing favoritism. Although that could be really the situation here. It seems to be the situation. But a lot of the scholars and the, the commentators say, no, it's simply this, that they were being overlooked, possibly because they lived on the outside of Jerusalem and the giving stations in Jerusalem. And so they're not familiar, okay? They're not familiar with the people who are working the tables versus the people who live in Jerusalem. They're very well known. And so it's easy connections. Here you go. Here's your need for today. I've seen you before. Simple as that. I truly believe it's this though, because the response of the apostles shows us they simply needed more help. The church was growing so much they needed more help so that people wouldn't be overlooked. I think that's important for us to understand because we're gonna be called to step up when there's a need, amen? So that this doesn't happen. All right, now I'll get more into that in a moment, but I just want you to see this next portion of scripture first. Verse two, so the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. It was, this was a big deal. They did not want this to happen. This was a problem. And they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God because that's what they were called to do, not running a food program. That's not an insult to those who run a food program. It's being the body of Christ and playing your role in the body of Christ. Okay, and we'll get more into that. And so brothers or those who were there, all the believers were there, women and men, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. This was very wise. The spirit of God obviously is leading them to get organized, amen? That's what it appears to be. And they say, choose seven men. Now, the Jewish custom at this time with any kind of business councils or tasks like this was the Jews always chose seven men. So right away, the church is doing their default response using their Jewish customs to put seven men over this specific task, all right? When I looked into this and all the commentaries, even people that would disagree with me, gender was not a qualification for fulfilling this task. I was shocked by that. I thought for sure it was gonna be used to say, see, only men can serve in church leadership roles, but that wasn't the case. The qualifications were this, well-respected, uh, people full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, okay? Now, how do we know that's true? We got, we got to remember, scripture interprets scripture, okay? Paul commended Phoebe, the deacon, all right? The deacon in Romans 16, one through two, she became a deacon of the church, a leadership role in the church. Uh, Junia was a, an apostle in the church, a female, although there's debates over that. But women took roles in the church in leadership as time went on. So I was shocked to find that there wasn't an argument over gender here. Their main focus was this. Their focus was, will they be full of the Holy Spirit and godly wisdom? Now you would think, that if you have a disorganization issue and you have people that need to know how to handle these money tables and these food tables, because that's what they were. In the Greek, what was said here was to serve or wait on tables. Not like a waiter, 
but almost like a tax collector. They would sit at a table and everyone who had need would come forward and they would distribute the funds or the food if they had it. And that's what the word in the Greek was explaining. The word deacon was never used in this context. Actually, the word deacon in the Greek was never mentioned in the book of Acts. But the church believes that it is possible that this helped inspire to form elders and deacons later on in the church because this worked. To appoint people to serve in roles to help the apostles, this ended up working. Now, in the end, most scholars and most um, commentators say that what happened here was a specific task of just seven because you don't have to have seven every time you have a board or you have deacons, you can have as many as you need, all right? So they say that this may have inspired why churches have deacons and elders or board members. Amen, are you following me here? All right, I just want you guys to understand that. It sounds like a lot of organization, doesn't it? But you would think they would call upon people who, you know, work at the container store and are very organized. Anyone like that? Anyone love organization? Like you have a place for everything? Anyone like natural born leaders, right? Anyone good at accounting and you're doing your taxes right now and you love it? You just get so much energy from doing your taxes. You love crunching numbers. I know a couple in here. You would think that they would have those people man those tables, but instead the requirements were, we're looking for full of the Holy Spirit and godly wisdom. Wow. You see, that, that's what we need to remember with all the situations you're going through, with everything you're facing, your business, your marriage, your kids, your life, your future, your church, the people you're trying to reach out to, it's not gonna be by your might or power. It's gonna be by the Holy Spirit. We need spirit-led solutions for worldly problems. We really do. And so here the church is being led by the Holy Spirit. And I think it's so wise that the apostles say, you pick the people. You pick these seven men. They didn't pick them. And do you know what they did? Not only did they pick men full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom, but they also picked all Greek speaking men. So the camp that was upset and complaining were the ones elected in their election. No no Arabic, or I'm sorry, Aramaic or Hebraic speaking believers were chosen. Now you think that that would be a little unfair. You know, at least have maybe half, right? No, even the Jewish uh, Hebraic speaking believers, you see how that's tongue tied? Like, I mean, I have, to, I have to keep doing this again and again, okay? The Hebraic speaking ones, not the Greek ones, even they chose they chose their requirements were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. It just happened to be they all spoke Greek as their primary language. Are you following me on that? Okay. Because look, at, look who was picked. Verse five, everyone liked this idea and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. We're gonna learn about him in coming weeks. Philip, we're gonna learn about him as well. Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. This is where I do like the NLT version because he helps you understand this. So listen to this. He converted to the Jewish faith and now converted to the Christian faith. He's been on a journey. Okay. So they all are from the outside region of Jerusalem, like Galilee and other places. They are, they're not in the city. They're on the outside and their primary language is Greek. The Lord led them to have these men in place and they weren't gonna have any more problems dealing with those complaints because everyone was gonna be treated fairly, amen? Everyone was gonna be taken care of. There wouldn't be anyone overlooked and they were gonna need spiritual wisdom and help from the Holy Spirit. Verse seven says this, there's, uh, I'm sorry, verse six says this, these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. What does that mean? Well, in scripture, we'll see times where people lay hands on people for the sick to be healed, lay hands on people for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
or lay hands on them for the commissioning of a task. When I became a pastor, I had a, a presbyter, an elder of our district, a leader over me, put his hands on my shoulder as I held a Bible and he prayed for the Holy Spirit to fill me and guide me as a pastor to help me fulfill my role. And uh, it was a special moment for me. And so I was commissioned for the task. And so that's what happened. This was such a big deal to the apostles. Don't, don't get this twisted. By them saying, great, now we can focus on prayer and teaching the word. That wasn't them saying they don't care about this role. They, they care about it. They care about it so much. They told the people to elect seven men, full of the Holy Spirit, not skills, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Why? They believe that the Holy Spirit would empower them for the task. And it was so important to them, they laid their hands on them because it was that important. You see where I'm coming from here? So they cared about this ministry. They care about, they know God's heart about widows. They know God's heart about orphans. They know that when someone's in need, we need to step up and help. And I believe that they were, they were um, broken in their heart that this was overlooked and they wanted to fix it. So praise God for that. And they did. What's the result? Verse seven. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers or disciples, depending on your translation, greatly increased in Jerusalem. And many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Now, that's amazing. The same priests who crucified Jesus, some of those priests who also had Peter and John in prison, last week we learned about that with Jody's sermon, are now getting saved. You see, if we keep preaching the gospel in the midst of trials and persecutions, the seed does fall on good soil. Or the seed may fall on hard soil, but God sends the rains and softens those people's hearts. Amen? Amen. He sends the rain. And so don't stop spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't even have this in my sermon outline, but listen, the devil won't want you to share your faith. He'll intimidate you. He'll say that person's hard as a rock. They're not going to listen to you. Send it anyway. Now, listen, the scripture does say, don't cast your pearls before swine. Believe it or not, Matthew 7, 6. So eventually, if they're not going to listen, don't keep throwing jewels to people are just going to stomp all over and not care. There is a time where that just, you just got to wipe your hands off, dust your feet off and keep going. But don't let, the first time you see someone, don't let their intimidating uh, demeanor or their attitude about Christianity or their life attitude stop you from spreading the gospel because it may fall on hard hearts, but God knows how to water those hearts so that it will sink in. Can you visualize that with me? Because I threw some grass seed on my backyard one day and I didn't know if it was gonna work because I didn't till it up very well. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And sure enough, it started growing because God knows what he's doing. God will help your seeds that you're planting, the, the gospel seeds, he will help them sink in. But one of the reasons why I, prefer the NIV or the New King James Version in this, in this portion of scripture particularly is because of the last verse. Let me read to you the NIV version. Let me catch up on my notes. I didn't realize I haven't been looking at my notes. Okay. NIV says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. That's different than just becoming Jewish converts. I mean, becoming believers. That's different. Obedient to the faith is a sign of true salvation. It's one thing to believe, have faith in Christ. It's another thing to see the works of Christ working through you because you now obey because Jesus has truly changed your heart. They needed to see that. They needed to see persecutors believe in such a way that now they're even obeying Jesus. We just sang about traditions and religion. These, these Sadducees who got saved here, these Pharisees and Sadducees, these priests, they were in religion and tradition for decades. That's all they knew was to follow their traditions they've created. They, they even added traditions onto God's commands. They added extra 
um, strict rules on God's commands that they shouldn't have done. And they were so strict in following them. You know, that's how they were pious, holy people in everyone's eyes, that they were so obedient to their religion and tradition that they missed Jesus the first time when he came, but now they're starting to see Jesus this time. And they are now obeying Jesus and following the way of Jesus Christ. When we were worshiping, I was gonna come back up, but you know what? I, I realized I have the mic for a sermon, so I'm gonna say it now. <laughs> Cause I already came up. I wanna keep coming up. And the Lord, the Lord was telling me strongly that you're trying to do it the way you've always done it. Your usual mode of operation, MO. I don't know what the situation is. God didn't get specific with me on your situation, okay? I could give you ideas, but listen, your usual mode of operation, if it doesn't include Jesus, you need to stop and allow Jesus to come in. You need to ask Jesus to take over. You need to, <laughs> Jesus take the wheel. I mean, it's true. And I recently saw a picture of someone who um, they had a picture of uh, Jesus' wheel collection, <laughs> steering wheel collection. That was hilarious. <laughs> he had like a dozen steering wheels on the wall pointing at them. These are all the wheels I took from everyone, all the steering wheels. But listen, I mean, if it's not working, maybe God's saying, I'm not answering your prayers. I'm not giving you the breakthrough because you're still trying to do it your way. It's the spirit of God who gives the breakthrough. There's things that God is doing this past week just from our prayer and fasting that I could never do on my own power. There's miracles taking place. There's people being healed this past week that we couldn't do on our power. Like I couldn't make that happen. I could give you like some, some, some NyQuil or something like that, but that's not gonna heal you. That's just gonna put a Band-Aid on it and help you get through. The Holy Spirit though has the power to fix your marriage has the power to fix your family, has the power to fix our community, okay? And, and we have a benevolence program. We have a food program here and we love helping those in need, but we also wanna give them the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. We know he's the true solution. He's the true solution. So don't get it twisted. Your, your, your gifts the physical gifts that you give and the food that we give away, it's helping us plant seeds. But in the end, we all know that it's only by the Holy Spirit that someone's gonna be saved or changed. And the Holy Spirit changed these priests who once crucified Jesus. So in case you thought that no one, that there's someone in your life that can't be changed, you're wrong. I'm wrong. Jesus can change any heart. I see you, sister. I'm praying for your husband. Jesus can change your heart and their heart. And so stop long enough to ask him to be the solution to the problem, amen? I'm already getting into the takeaways. But the obvious one, I didn't even put on the screen because it's obvious. When someone's in need, the church needs to be ready, right? And so I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for um, serving in the benevolence ministry here with uh, Margaret. Thank you, thank you, God, for Margaret. Yeah, praise God. Amen. Uh, this hasn't happened because we have a Margaret <laughs> and a team, but but we get the complaints here and there, and you know, just be careful what you hear out there, because uh, a lot of times when we've had to turn people away, it's because they've been robbing every food pantry. And so that means that someone's missing out on food because they keep taking all the boxes. They're being greedy. All right, so when people put little reviews on Google, hey, they didn't help me, they didn't help me. Well, there's a reason sometimes too, but we're not gonna tell you the whole story, okay? Trust me, we're very generous and we love helping people. We also have to, are teaching people not to take advantage of God's gifts. We're trying to teach people to be good stewards and to be grateful and to, and to accept these things with humility and all that. All right, so there's a lot that goes in that. Margaret needs your prayer. But listen to me, Margaret and her team, they handle it so well, I don't even worry about it. 
And whenever she needs me, I, I give her advice, but she's usually already had it figured out. But we have to be ready to take care of needs. But here's the, the first one too, or the takeaways I have for us. I'm going a little deeper, okay, than that. Number one, we can be spirit-led and organized at the same time. We can be spirit-led and organized at the same time. Organization and structure is a good thing, church. It's a good thing that we're organized today. The Holy Spirit helped the church get organized as it grew. And God wants things done in decency and order. And if you don't believe me, consider the books of Leviticus and Numbers and then come back and talk to me. <laughs> My goodness, that's really organized. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. You gotta like numbers to, to read numbers. Chaos and disorder is not a reflection of God, but of sin. God brings things into order, sin breeds disorder. You don't believe me, read Genesis one through four. God brought everything into order, even gave us a task to rule and reign over creation, animals, even gave Adam the ability to name all them. He needed a helper, so he, to help him, he brought in the woman, Eve. He was all about order and organization. As soon as the devil snuck in, things got disorderly, didn't it? See, organization re reveals God, okay? Organization is a healthy thing. It's a good thing. However, please take this with, with this perspective as well. We should be careful not to structure or organize the Holy Spirit out of our lives, out of our churches, or out of our decisions. The Spirit leads organization, but the Spirit will not be compartmentalized. You cannot put the Holy Spirit in a box. And we should never dictate the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit should dictate our organization. See, the Holy Spirit was working through the church at this time. Remember the book of Acts, Luke is trying to show everyone, and, and well, particularly Theophilus and anyone who would read these letters like us today. And the Lord is leading Luke on what to record and put in here. The emphasis is on the acts of the Holy Spirit through the people of God. So the Holy Spirit is leading the church to get organized. The church isn't telling the, the Holy Spirit what we want. The Holy Spirit's telling them what to do. And let's be careful not to dictate the Holy Spirit out of our lives or so organize our life that the Holy Spirit has no say. This morning in our prayer, sir, our prayer time as a team here, the Holy Spirit nudged me to come up when I did today, all right, and say, we need to be, we need to call out and make room for the Holy Spirit in our lives. Our plan was we do three songs, pray, Dorothy comes up and then I come up and the Holy Spirit changed that this morning. And in both services, you responded accordingly. And so I'm following the nudging and the voice of the Holy Spirit when he says to do things like that. Even right now, as I preach, I'm trying to be led by the Holy Spirit and not my flesh. I don't wanna dictate what the Holy Spirit wants to do today. I want the Holy Spirit to lead me on what's supposed to happen today. Same thing in your life. What if we stop for a moment and say, Lord, how should I love my spouse? Now he's gonna probably say, well, I kind of showed you in the scriptures. <laughs> But Lord, how am I handling my spouse? Do I need to handle her or him differently? You know, all, you can ask anything. Lord, lead and guide us for our kids' decisions today to help us with their decisions for college, whatever it may be. Like, what if we stopped and said, Lord, I make room for your spirit to lead us instead of me controlling the outcomes that I can't really control. I really can't do that. So here's a practical one. Now, listen, I'm, I, I, I always start with the spiritual and I'm having, I'm having a little fun with this, but I'm like partially serious at the same time, okay? Clean your room. Get organized. All the teens are like, wait, what? Hey, 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 hey. Hey. I can't wait to clean my garage. It needs it. Oh my goodness. Don't open your closet. You don't want to see. But listen, what? But look, let's get organized. Every time I look at my garage, you know what it says? 
it says you're too busy. I'm being serious. You're not, you're so busy that you can't take the time to put that wire back on that hook. Or you're being lazy and want to rush to the, to rest in the couch instead of just, now I get it. Some of you are really gifted at organization and some of us are terrible at it. That's me. Okay. But listen, ever since the Lord called me to be a pastor of this church, he has convicted me to be organized because the spirit of God will convict us to be organized. I was talking to a young man on the phone. He's 17 years old. His life was out of order, way off. You know what he was doing? He was confessing his sins. He was making decisions right then in the moment on that phone to turn away from sin. He was gonna apologize to his mom, apologize to his principal for how he's behaving in school. I was like, praise God, little revival on the phone. It was beautiful. And so we got everything in order. I said, look, you know, Lord, God first, loving your family, loving those at school, like your principal and apologizing for lying to him and things like that. He said, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna make things right. And I, and I stopped for a moment because his life was so out of order. He didn't know what to do. And you know what the Holy Spirit led me to do? The Holy Spirit led me to ask him, how does your room look right now? I'm, I'm being dead serious. I, I'm not kidding. I, ask my wife. I'm not the organized one in the home. Right, wife? No, yeah. <laughs> She's the organized one. I mean, she has a place for everything. If I twist something, she's like, you've been in my room. You've been on my stuff. You've been touching my stuff, haven't you? I'm like, how did she know that? Maybe, maybe her influence is helping me. Okay. But listen, I said, hey, what does your room look like? He said, oh man, it's a mess. I said, how does it make you feel? He said, it doesn't help me. It doesn't make me feel good at all. I said, you know what? You know what I, I need to tell you right now is your messy room is reinforcing your messy life. What you're seeing is what you're going through spiritually and physically and emotionally. Now, I didn't think that was gonna happen because I had a room that needed to be cleaned up. And you know what I did after that phone call? You know what I did? I said, man, Lord, you're getting me on this one. Ooh, but think about that. God is a God of order, right? And so even on our practical sense, the Lord may lead you to get organized. Why? So that you're functioning better for his glory. So that when your life is in order, when, when, you're, when God is first and family and, and is second and church is third, and, and your finances are getting in order and your life is getting in order and you're gonna start thriving. And next thing you know it, even the practical things like a clean room starts to get organized and clean because God's a God of order. Amen, amen kids, amen, students, amen. <laughs> amen, parents, I should say. Yeah. Sorry, teens, I apologize, but I gotta just tell you what God told me to say. Have fun cleaning, all right. But on a serious note, parents, um, help your kids learn how to do that by the way you live, but also come into the room and say, I'll help you because this is overwhelming. You know, your clothes are this high. Can I help you? <laughs> so anyway, secondly, the church needs men and women full of the spirit and wisdom. I've already covered this in our pre, you know, during the worship time, but the Holy Spirit empowers us for the task that he gives us. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was in, uh, in high school, I was 17, junior year, and we had no one to do worship for the worship team. Uh, my, my, my sister got a guitar for Christmas and she never played it really. And there was no one to lead worship for the, the youth group because the one who was doing it went off to college. Do you know what the Lord did? Do you know that within three months I was playing guitar and leading worship at the youth group? And I wish I could say that I magically grabbed the guitar, you know. No, it wasn't like that. He planted a desire in my heart to help the church, the youth group. I saw my, my sister's guitar, sorry sister, but it wasn't being used. <laughs> and so I grabbed it and I had the endurance and desire to keep teaching myself how to play. Within three months, I started playing a guitar for the youth group. That is the power of the Holy Spirit coming over someone for a task, okay? Now listen, um, I can't play the piano, so that's for someone else. And that's okay. 
By the way, I don't really play much anymore. Every, every once in a while, I pick it up and have fun. Um, but I, I only got so far as what I taught myself to do, all right? But the Lord can empower you for a task at the church or in his kingdom work outside the church. So stay open to what he wants to do. All right, thirdly and lastly, the church grows when the whole church takes ownership for its growth. We read it. We can't escape this. We read about it. When there was a problem and a very important problem, making sure all the widows were being taken care of fairly, the apostles stepped in, the people voted, and the people voted stepped up. Everyone was involved. And because of that, the church grew rapidly. I want, to, I want to just let you know this. I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to say this to shame or manipulate. But all I'm saying is when we all do our part in the kingdom of God, oh my goodness, wait till you see what this church can do. Because we're thriving now. Can you imagine though, if, if we all play our role and our part in the body of Christ, what we can accomplish together? It's gonna be beautiful. It's gonna be beautiful. The church grows when the church serves. Let me show you something. What was happening in this church is the growth was greater than the leadership. They couldn't handle the growth. And so God led the apostles to appoint people over this food ministry and this benevolence ministry at this time. Literally, that's what they had. Much like what we have today to take care of the widows. And so here's the 12 apostles, including Matthias, because Matthias was replaced Judas. So here's the leadership of the church. And here was the amount of people and the needs that they had. And this is what happened. The leadership couldn't sustain the growth. And so things were crumbling apart in one particular area. Again, if the apostles could multiply themselves and have, you know, clone themselves and have multiple Peters and Johns, they probably would but they knew that's not God's will. God's will is that other people step up and God will call other people to step up in leadership or serve. And because of that, it turned into more like this. There was more leadership and you know, builders like to make it look like this, right? Don't builders like to like stagger it a little bit. That looks nicer, right? Yeah. You could do this, but no one builds a wall like that. I'm pretty sure I always see it like this, right? That looks prettier, looks cooler. I'm just joking with you. I know that's the way it is, but I'm just. <laughs> in other words, if we in the pew and the pulpit, if we are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, and, and I, I, I apologize, I did not explain what that meant. Whenever you see the phrase, they were full of the Holy Spirit, it meant either baptized in the Holy Spirit like Acts 2, it meant living in the fruit of the spirit, joy, peace, patience. They demonstrated the fruit of the spirit. They demonstrated the character of Christ or they, get, they were given a special anointing or special uh, filling to preach or do something. We're gonna read about that. The Holy Spirit came over Stephen. The Holy Spirit came over Peter. We already did. They were full of the Holy Spirit in a moment or they were full of the Holy Spirit in a lifestyle. Whenever you see that, we need people we all need to be full of the Holy Spirit because a need will rise up and you will be equipped for the task. Even when you think you can't do it, he will give you the ability to do it. When a church is healthy, it's actually healthy down here so they can handle even more growth. Can you imagine if the church was on one person and one pastor and we're trying to you know, stay afloat with the growth? Or even this, and then I gotta go like this, and we all know what's gonna happen. It's gonna fall apart. Only Jesus can, can hold everything together because he's the cornerstone, but he's the foundation that we all stand on, all right? The church grows when we grow in the spirit. The church grows when we're full of the spirit and we're serving and we're helping. I wanna show you a picture again. This isn't to make you feel a certain way, this isn't to lift him up. This just really blessed my heart. And the Bible says, give honor where honor's due. You know, and to show honor, to appreciate. When someone's mourning, we mourn with them. When someone's being honored, we honor them together. I walked in one morning for worship. I'm closing with this. I walked in one morning for worship, practice, starts at seven. And I saw Daniel 
standing, you know, on the stage and he's, he's warming up, getting ready for worship practice, seven in the morning here on Sundays. And I look past him. I said, what? Who is that? So go to the next picture for me. And it's hard to see, but there's a baby and there's three boys. So there's four of his sons there. Okay. And, and I don't know, Daniel, what time you had to get up to make sure they're all ready to go that morning. But I'm guessing around six-ish to make sure you're here by seven for rehearsal. And then I saw this picture. I, I, I had to take a picture of this. I just couldn't, this happened weeks ago. Um, you can go to the next, next picture. And so we're praying as a team before we do our worship set in the morning. And I see Daniel holding his boy and his three boys. And I said, Lord, bless him. Bless him. Help him and Keisha. Because here he is, dedicated, committed. Could have said, hey, I got the kids by myself. I can't sing today. Instead, he got them ready and brought them to church. And what, yeah, praise God. <laughs> praise the Lord. And you know, I, I just encouraged me. And uh, you know what's a blessing is his kids are seeing what it looks like to be committed. His kids are seeing what it looks like to be dedicated. His kids are seeing what it looks like to serve the Lord, to not quit or to not back out and to be strong and be resilient and all these things. What a way to teach, serving God, being in the church. You know, what's important? He is showing them what's important. And so, you know what I'm asking? I'm asking that we, we also seek the Lord on this. I wanna show you a slide we have. You know, I realized that we don't actually show you guys our serving opportunities and places to serve enough. So here's, a, here's a, a picture. And if you take your phone and you just point your camera, turn your camera on, this is how this works in case you've never done QR codes. <laughs> I, I pr we're closing in a second, I promise. You take, your, you take your phone out, you turn your camera on, and typically your phone will turn into a link on the screen and that will take you to this webpage of all the different places that you may be able to serve here. Now, listen, I actually don't want you to rush this. I, and it may, there may not be something on here. You know, a lot of you are serving all week without serving in a Calvary ministry. And I appreciate that. You're loving people, you're helping people, you're caring for people. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. But thank you so much. Yeah. There, there, aren't thing, there are things that are not on there as well. Um, but listen, I, I wanna encourage you to pray and seek the Lord on how can I help the church in the walls or outside the walls or both, whatever it may be. What has God gifted me or what do I need to you know, spread my wings and trust the Holy Spirit to help me with? But listen, we actually want you to not rush that. We actually want you to be prayerful about it because it's better that you find your fit then try something over and over again and keep bailing out or quitting, okay? It's, it's actually better for you and for the church that you take your time and go, Lord, how can I serve? What would be my role? And we also have a staff member that helps us do that. So the other reason why I need to take your time too a little bit and not too long, but you know, is because we won't be able to handle all of you turning in stuff in tomorrow, okay? So why don't we stand together? What I'm asking you to do is be spirit led in this and not just do it because I showed you a picture of someone serving in a slide. And if you don't mind, put that slide back up for a little bit longer in case people need it at the end. Um, I'm asking you to be spirit led. How does God wanna use me in the church, outside the church? And I wanna encourage you to go for it. I encourage you to go for it. Everyone good? Praise the Lord. There's an army for the Lord in here ready to help us reach the community. It's awesome. Lord, lead my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, my fellow daughters and sons in Christ, my fellow grandfathers and grandmothers and this whole family we have. It's so good to be part of this family. Thank you, Lord, that you have placed us in the body to do different things. And we need all the different body parts to function properly and healthily. Lord, lead and guide us because we know, God, that if we're full of the Holy Spirit and full of godly wisdom, Lord, we can 
do whatever you call us to do. God, help us to seek your direction with everything in our lives, not just serving, everything. God, forgive us for trying to fix things with our own power or might or abilities. And we ask for your spirit to begin to work ahead of us and before us. To do what your spirit can do that we can't do, Lord, do it. And Lord, lead and guide us in how we can be involved in serving. Lord, thank you, God, for this church and the growth that we're experiencing. Lord, I pray you would call up even more leaders, whether it be ministers, whether it be staff, or full-time volunteers with their time that they have after work, whatever it may be, Lord, in any ministry, new ministries, whatever it may be, God, I pray, Lord, that you would call us up, elevate us, Lord, spiritually, first of all, being full of your spirit and wisdom. And then, Lord, send us out to reach this community. God, I pray that we wouldn't, that we wouldn't look down on ourselves that we wouldn't think less of ourselves. Lord, you give us the power to do what you called us to do. The Lord equip us and empower us. Thank you, God, for this church. Thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness, Lord, that we experience in you and the faithfulness of this church body. We give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you need to begin a, a journey with Jesus today, our prayer team members will be down here. If you need prayer for anything, if your garage is really disorganized, you need prayer over you, we'll do that too. But come on down if you need help. God bless you. Have a great day.